Lila Westrick is a PhD candidate in the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. Welcome. Lila studies the foraging behavior of native bees across a variety of flowering landscapes in Western Washington and the impact of forage patterns on native bee health and fitness. So welcome to both of you. Um, to moving to the faculty, Sunny Jardine is an assistant professor in the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs. Um, she shares an office space pretty close to where I am, so I get the privilege of actually interacting with her very often. Sunny's research is broadly focused on the economics of conservation policy for marine and coastal systems, which involves understanding how economic markets and institutions impact the value of ecosystem services that are generated in a coupled human natural systems. And Alex Gagnon, who's an assistant professor in the School of Oceanography, I interact a lot with Alex in, in, um, in our marine biology program, and it's a privilege to, to see you here as well, Alex. Alex's lab uses geochemical approach to study how ocean acidification and other changes to seawater chemistry impact calcifying organisms and biogeochemical cycles. So these are our panel members, very lucky to have you here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to explain just briefly how we're going to um, try and run this session. Um, I'm the first person to acknowledge that the webinar um, format is not ideal for, for discussion, but what we want to do is that we want to encourage discussion as much as possible from everyone, especially our atten attendees. We really want to hear from you and we want to share experiences so that we can all kind of um, learn from each other. So this is a weird environment. Essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all um, ask the panelists to speak to specific prompt questions. And then we're going to ask um, the attendees to actually vote on what they'd like to talk about. You can contribute as, as an attendee, you can contribute in two ways. One is that you can um, go to the Q&A and you can ask your question there. And if, you, um, if you'd like to speak to us, so if you'd like to appear within the panel group, you put up your hand um, and speak through that way. Okay, now I know that's a bit intimidating because having sat in the audience and kind of seen yourself suddenly promoted into the panel environment can be a bit weird, right? But we're going to do our best to, to welcome you um, within our group. Okay, so that's the way that the whole procedure is going to happen. All right, I'm actually going to start this discussion by just asking the panelists to, to reflect with us for a few minutes um, about their um, backgrounds. Now, most of you, most of you, um, as attendees, what you did is that you received a handout which um, basically talked about the roles of required um, and suggested roles of advisors and mentors. And I'm not going to go through that in any great detail. What we want you to take home from that um, uh, handout is basically there are required roles, right? You have a major professor, you have a graduate committee member, you've got program advisors, and you've got bro um, graduate program coordinators. But we also would like you to recognize that there are other roles in your life as grad students. And essentially these are suggested roles. These are the other parts that people play within your lives. And this is an academic mentor, a scholarly mentor, right? Somebody who's part of your community who holds you to different standards, a sponsor, a champion, and what, what euphemistically is called the kitchen cabinet, which is the set of people the student chooses to help support their graduate school efforts. Um, so what we'd like you to do as we go through these discussions is we'd like to, you to think about the different roles of each of these people in your lives. Okay, so first of all, let's take a look from the mentor perspective, right? Mentors can provide an opportunity for lifelong relationships. They become your colleagues, they're your advisors, they can be your role models, right? But mentoring can be, while mentoring can be very satisfying, the idea of mentoring should be reconsidered in how we define the role of a mentor. It's not a top-down relationship, but a journey of co-discovery where we learn together and share an experience and a collaboration. And so with this kind of backing, what I want to do is I actually want to ask our two faculty members, how would you describe your approach to mentoring? and advising. So um, Sunny, if you don't mind, I'm going to call on you first. Sure. Um, first off, I just want to say I'm really excited to be here and learn and hear from others. You know, as a faculty member, 
unlike research, I'm rarely asked to document my methods to mentoring and sort of reflect on them. So I think that this is a really nice and rare opportunity. Um, in terms of how I approach mentoring, I think, you know, my style has been really to follow students' leads. I think students can be so different from each other. So I really look to understand from the student, you know, what's productive for you? How often should we be meeting? How much structure do you need on those meetings? How much input do you need from me? Do you need time to go off and be creative and come back to me after, um, you know, maybe a month? And so that takes a lot of observation of the individuals and what's working for them and what's not. And really clearly, because sometimes people don't know what works for them yet. They haven't been in a setting like this and, and it's new. And so just being able to really keep close tabs on people to make sure that their choices regarding our relationship are, are working to be productive and serve them in their career goals. So I think my general approach is really to follow students' leads after understanding where they're trying to go. I wanna make sure that I can help them get there, but not impose my own preferences in terms of structure on that relationship. Fantastic, Sunny. Alex, how about you? How would you describe your, your role, your approach to mentoring? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think I play a, a bunch of, you know, uh, we play a bunch of different roles as, as mentors, right? In, in some ways, the, the strongest, most important thing is to be a cheerleader that day. Um, I think a really important role of as a mentor um, is as professional advocate or a champion, I think is maybe the, one of the terms that, that you said. You know, if you, if you join my lab, um, it's kind of my role to go to back to you professionally for kind of forever. Right. I mean, that's a pretty that's that's part of one of the special things about sort of the, the academic path, uh, the, the sort of um, uh, graduate men mentor relationship. Um, uh, and I said academic path there. So I'm going to do a slight a, a slight uh, side trip. Um, uh, I've, I've been really lucky to be work with a lot of great um, uh, graduate students and postdocs and undergraduates and research staff. And there's a pretty big diversity of professional goals. Um, in, in that, amongst that group, even amongst the graduate students. And um, I'm, I'm pretty proud that we've been able to put them on, uh, you know, help them get working together, help them get to lots of, to get to their, reach their goal, right? Um, uh, wh whatever, whatever that is. Um, and I think that's sort of what success looks like um, as, as far as a mentor. So um, uh, cheerleader, professional advocate, um, but I think one, and, and I think one of the themes today that we're going to see is right is that you need to build this network of people who act as these different roles um, to sort of support you along the way. Um, but one role that I think that you is is never de delegated is really at the center, at the heart of, of what my role is, um, especially with graduate students and, and postdocs, is as as a research mentor. And I think that has sort of like the two important parts, right? There's the stuff that, that you think of that you probably already know um, or, or expect, right? Someone that works together with you to sort of help you um, grow intellectually. Um, someone who's there to understand your science and talk with you about it and help you sort of deeply engage with it. Um, uh, someone who's there to sort of help you set you up with the scientific tools you need for success. Someone there that sort of nurture, help you with your creativity let you take those sort of steps on, on your own and know that there's someone there to catch you a little bit. Um, it's, it's also important, I think, someone who's there to sort of set norms and model intellectual rigor, mm -hmm. right? So those are the sort of things that you, that probably we all think of if we sort of sat down on, on with, a, with a, you know, to try to make a list of our own. But I, I also, as, as, as I was reflecting on this, I think one of the really big roles of a research mentor um, uh, is to share uh, a passion for, for science and learning. And so I think there are these days when um, you're able to bring the tools that you learned in school, um, disciplinary information, theory, math, you know, the sort of hands-on techniques, together with creativity and being able to sort of look and, and see the world. And sometimes when all those things come together, your experiments that you're doing or the data that you're collecting matches predictions in a way that doesn't just test like your narrow question, 
but opens up this whole new field. And you realize that the predictions that you didn't even know were part of your theory are sort of matching up in the world and everything sort of comes together. And in those moments, you feel like you've got like your finger on the pulse of the universe, right? And it's this incredibly empowering feeling. And I think that that's a really important role of, you know, research advisor to try to help students get to the point that they have the tools to be able to be part of that and, and to lead part of that, right? And, and these are fleeting things, you know, I, I'm selecting that, that best day in graduate school and not the other five years or whatever. Yeah, I, I hear you. That, that passion for science. Uh, fantastic, right? So from both Sunny and Alex, you basically heard an, um, a, a philosophy of student forward, right? So Sunny basically says, um, I, you know, she's, she basically puts the student forward and, and helps the student guide the mentoring experience. From Alex, you saw um, the, the um, role of cheerleader, professional advocate, and helping students develop the tools so that they can jump into that exciting moment of discovery. So thank you both. Right. Um, so um, for our grad panelists, I'm going to ask you, um, Megan, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Um, can you describe your experiences with mentors that have been especially helpful in your um, academic career? Hi, yeah. Um, thanks for having me. This is so great to be here. Uh, I'm Megan Mueller. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I feel like everything that Sunny and Alex just said was so fantastic. I was taking notes myself. Um, like this is how I want to interact with undergrads who work with me and other people. So um, thanks for everything you said. That's awesome. I think for me, um, there's maybe one, maybe two faculty members who sort of know the nitty gritty of the research I'm doing. And I feel like um, that's really, you know, a space where I have academic sort of mentorship, but I think a lot of the people who have really sort of sustained me as a graduate student have been mentors who are not uh, in on the science, but are just supporting me personally. And so I think that um, how I would answer this question is, I think the helpful experiences I've had are with uh, mentors in the department who, um, are really advocating for me personally and my experiences and my identities and sort of the values I have, the way I wanna do science, um, the career choices I wanna make, things like that. And so I think for me, I've really tried to cultivate relationships with faculty who I admire personally and professionally and, and know that they will support me um, in the choices I make or how I show up to spaces and things like that. And so, I think for me, um, just the helpful experiences have been really seeking out and being proactive to find those people and asking for time with them regularly or asking for help or questions or just, I'm thinking about applying for this, can you help me? Or I'm thinking about this, can we meet and talk? Or um, I really like this paper you published, that was awesome. Just like doing whatever I can to sort of cultivate relationships um, with people who feel like champions of me as a person. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Lila. Yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone again for having me as well. Um, I'm Lila. I use she or they pronouns. Uh, and I, I feel the exact same way as Megan. It's funny that you bring all that up. Uh, when I was thinking about the question, I was actually talking to my partner about it. And we were trying to talk about like, what is a mentor? And I know there's that academic side to things, but I see a lot of the, the responsibilities of an advisor to make sure that you succeed, right? That's, that's how I see their job. Um, whereas when I think about mentors, yes, my advisor is a mentor, but for completely different reasons than the things I kind of expect him to fulfill in my life as a graduate student. And when I think about uh, people who have been the greatest mentors, they're usually people who have, as Megan said, supported me, uh, regardless of whether they understand what I'm doing. I also fall into a category of um, graduate students where I do a lot of genetic work, a lot of genetic work in my, in my research and my advisor is not a genetics guy. Uh, almost no one on my committee is a genetics person. No one has a background in it. So a lot of the last five years have been um, 
on me to explain, learn everything, explain everything, bring everything to them. Um, and the best people out of that are the ones who say, okay, got it. I'll write this down or remember it. And when you come back and you have questions, we'll try to work through them. Um, but the mentors really, they fell into a place where it, it didn't matter if they understood, they supported me no matter what. Um, and I, I think the best mentor experience I've, I've ever had was I, when I had my qualifying exam, um, it went quite poorly. It was for a number of reasons. Uh, I, I passed it, but kind of like a just barely passed. Uh, that's how I felt at least coming out of it. I felt like, well, I didn't pass that. Yeah. Yeah. It's written on the paper and I checked off the box, but I, I failed. I, co I totally failed. I embarrassed myself. And one of my committee members who is one of my mentors, she uh, saw me afterwards and she saw that I was visibly upset and she came up to me and she was like, you know, that doesn't matter, right? Like, this is a stepping stone and you get through the stepping stone and then you're successful. It's totally fine. It went great. And just hearing her say that after someone who had been in the room, someone who had experienced that with me, she didn't say you did great and you knew everything and you passed with flying colors. She said, it doesn't matter what happened. You passed, you move on. Let's keep going. Let's keep going together. So yeah, my, my experience with mentors have definitely been people who they aren't necessarily in on what I'm doing. They aren't necessarily supporting me academically, but they're always there for me. They're always willing to pick up the phone, to text me, to email me, to check in. Um, this is fantastic, Megan and Lila. Thank you so much. I mean, so from both of you, we actually we actually heard, yes, the, you know, your advice is a very important person, but what we've heard from you is actually this network that you build around you, right? So, so Megan, you you actually you you basically say is that it's not necessarily the people that are in on your science, right? And and you basically like the people who are, who identify who who support your identities and um, values. Lila, your your example is just fabulous. Somebody who was um, in the room with you, who was honest with you, right, and very supportive. And um, I actually like the the image that you've given us of of you going and explaining to people your research and then them responding by saying that um, they will learn so that they they can help you um, think through things so what fantastic um, what what fantastic contributions thank you yeah um, let me let me now ask um, so essentially I think at this point um, um, Anthony we have a poll don't we um, for the for the panelists to basically um, uh, oh okay sorry um, so I'm still learning how to drive this. Um, we actually have a question from one of our attendees and I'd like to address it, right? And this is to Megan. It says, can you talk more about how you cultivate relationships with mentors outside other than your research advisors and how this has worked out this year in a more virtual setting? Yeah, yeah just that's put a, it on you. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, other people feel free to weigh in. I think for me, um, well, I guess a lot of us are in science because we're curious and we're excited and we're here because we want to understand something about the natural world. And so I feel like I really um, was encouraged to by a faculty member actually, who's not on my committee or whatever, but here in the department who said, you should take every opportunity to learn while you're a grad student. And I've really taken that to heart by just taking as many classes as I can and seminars and just showing up to um, colloquiums and being on committees and inviting myself to different research groups and things like that. But I think um, because I have really intentionally tried to be a part of a lot of science, I've interacted with a lot of faculty members that has then set me up to go to them um, for help in the future and, and ask questions. Um, and I think it's like both broadened my science and helped me like have a landscape for, you know, where is geology at as a field and where are we going, but also has like really, um, yeah, just allowed me to approach people when I have had really tough times or needed help navigating tough situations where it's like we already have a relationship because I took your class or I um, attended your research group or whatever. And that's, I guess maybe the, the cost of that has been that maybe I don't do research as quickly or whatever, but have been, um, yeah, intentional to get involved. And so I think that would probably be my advice. And then how that's worked in the virtual world, I just approach email people and just be like, hey, 
I'm having a problem. I feel like the patriarchy is getting me down this week. Like I've had these horrible experiences. I know you've experienced something similar. Can we just Zoom for 30 minutes? And everyone has been really helpful in that way. Um, and I think even in the virtual world, I've also just been emailing people who I've met previously by attending colloquiums or whatever, and just been like, hey, I saw you publish this new paper. This is awesome. I'd love to talk to you for 30 minutes on Zoom. And so I've been doing that with you know researchers across the US, just trying to build my professional network that way. And I think Zoom has really facilitated that. So, yeah. Yes, thank you. Lana, did, did you want to speak to this point as well? Like, I how, would, how to yeah. Make, yeah. I would echo Megan. I mean, I think I've, as most people have in the in the pandemic, I have um, reduced my bubble a little bit, both professionally and in person, right? Uh, and so I'm not necessarily trying to find people, but I can I can imagine that if you're you know a new grad student or a new degree seeker, you're probably trying to expand your network right now, and that's really difficult looking at the space. But yeah, I'd also offer similar to what Megan brought up most of my points, but uh, you know everyone's on their computers right now. Everyone is sitting in front of their phones and maybe that's not the best thing, but it is really easy to get in touch with people. Um, if someone doesn't email you back, you can assume that, yeah, they probably had 60,000 emails in their inbox and four different graduate students trying to talk to them. But if you send another one, they'll probably respond to you because that's all they're gonna do today is look at their computer. So I've, I've definitely noticed that uh, even just with research questions, I've reached out to a lot of people. I'm, I'm trying to move toward being in the process of writing my dissertation now and uh, I've talked to a lot of people about methods and writing and it's been so easy to contact other researchers so with with research questions so I can imagine that if you were looking for someone to kind of mentor you or, or answer some of your kind of bigger life questions they'd be just as willing to do so so yeah I found the same thing that it's not necessarily uh it's been a little harder right you can't just walk in, up to someone's office and knock but academics are kind of uh hard to get a hold of even in person so I, I think it's it's the same amount of struggle just we have to push ourselves in different directions now fantastic great advice really um i don't know if you guys know about this but there's a sneaky way through zoom where you can actually see if somebody's actually online and in a meeting so you can you can actually contact them through through chat and zoom to, to see if you can connect with them so don't tell anyone i told you that Okay. Um, okay, at this point, um, Anthony, um, I understand that we've got a poll for our participants. Um, I, I have to admit, I can't see it. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, Anthony, would you like to launch your the first poll? Yeah. So yeah. the first thing we're going to do is just, you know, the first poll is just about getting to know you. So do we just want to find out, you know, what department you're in and what year you're in. Uh, so you'll see that in progress now. So if you would just take a quick moment. Uh, just to fill that out, our participants. Thank you. Got a number of staff students in your first year. Okay, 24, great. All right, so um, let's see. So the next thing we're gonna just look at here. So we've we've looked at the, the mentoring uh, the mentor, mentee to mentor relationship and we looked at the mentor to mentee relationship. So the first uh, poll is just really gonna ask you questions about the mentee mentor relationship. So I just want you to you know, think about you know, what you've heard and what you've learned so far. I, I think it would actually help to, to know what everyone wants to talk about as well. Right, and put those uh, in the, the Q&A section. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So it's 21 to 23, that's just fine. And the next one is, you know, looking at the mentor-mentee relationship. So that's from the faculty panelists. What did you learn from what you heard from them? And so when you launch that. Is there a hand raised amongst the participants? Yeah, there is a, there is a hand raised. Um, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, let's get to that in a second. 
Okay, another few seconds. Uh, Carrie, it looks like the hand uh, raised was. Yeah, I saw that. Today. I saw that. So, okay. so essentially, um, one of the reasons of the poll is that we actually wanted to get an understanding about what the audience wanted to talk about the most, right? Um, and um, in in um, doing so, so while while we're while we're trying to get an understanding of that, um, we do have a question that's come from our um, our um, attendees. And one was, um, I think Alex was about to say something reconnecting with new mentors earlier. So curious to hear the mentor perspective on this. So Alex, can I ask you to answer that question and then I'll ask um, uh, Sunny about it. Yeah, sure, sure. And I was just a quick add on because the, our, our student panelists said really great things. And actually I was nice to hear that, um, you know, the ways that they're reaching out to make connections, that's that's not always an easy thing. And so, you know, we, we sort of, we can talk about all the ways that, that it works, but I recognize that, you know, that takes a lot of work and sort of taking that step out into the unknown to cold call someone is not always easy. Um, and so it's great that, that you held up that example of, um, of what it looks like and that it's not scary and that it is rewarding. Um, I was just gonna add to that to sort of maybe help people get over that bridge is that um, I think like probably a lot of you the faculty are desperate for human interactions too right now. And so these sort of conversations by Zoom to be able to talk science with someone who wants to talk science is actually a really is a nice break in the day. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe this is one of the few things that you were sort of hinting at there that you can have a more geographically broad network because of this whole Zoom distance thing that's um, going on. The only other thing that I was gonna add is that uh, uh, I, as, I, I can sort of think of this as both a mentor, but also, right, I was a graduate student and postdoc too coming up. And um, there was a point in graduate school where I started switching sort of the way that I was using some of the formal mechanisms of mentorship, like my committee and things, to try to steer them in ways more for professional development, for instance. And so there were a few opportunities towards the end of graduate school where I could add members to my committee. And I did that less, you know, for the second half of grad school, that was less for the specific expertise to um, for my project and more because they were people that I admired that I knew were good in the field and who I wanted to you know have an opportunity for them to get to know me so that they could give me good advice good professional advice and also so they could write letters for me right and, and sort of be professional advocates and so um, again it's not always easy to sort of see these opportunities and it sounds good you know thinking back as like like it was all the plan but there was there's a little bit of steering that was going on there to try to you know, steer or hijack the, the formal mechanisms too. Thanks, Alex. Um, Sunny, yeah. Yeah, I'll just add to that, that I'm very impressed by what Megan and Lila said in terms of how they're approaching people and sort of drawing in on all of the resources that are here on campus to sort of develop their own professional goals. And that's really impressive. And that would be my advice is that you should do this. And I think that, um, well, as Alex said, it might be intimidating, but there's a lot of ways. And I think that faculty inherently wanna see our students be successful or UW students be successful. And there's a lot of ways to do this. You know, you might be interested in an agency that's outside of academia, but you see that someone has on their CV that they're publishing with co-authors that have jobs in these agencies. There's a lot of ways to tap into faculty networks by just learning what faculty are up to and asking them about that in a way that can help you get to where you wanna go. And I think faculty will be really receptive to that. I think a lot of times students approach the relationships or at least from my experience as that the faculty are there only to talk about research, but I think that there's so much more that faculty can offer, um, but it oftentimes takes a student to ask those questions. 
So we're hearing again this common theme about this broader network that is basically going to support students. There is actually a follow-up from this question. It's basically, it's like, how can those two students make these connections, right? And how to build healthy, productive mentorship relationships from the start. So I'm actually gonna ask our, our two student panelists, what tips or tricks do you have um, to, to help, help build those relationships right from the very start? Um, so Megan, can I call on you? Yeah, oh, Lana, you were ready to talk. I'm sorry, go for it. I figured I, I go first this time since Megan went first yeah. last time. Uh, yeah, I, I think, I mean, we talk a, we've talked a little bit about like mentors outside of academia mentors um, on your committee or off your committee. I think for first years, you're focusing so much on putting together your committee, uh, whether you're PhD or master's or professional degree program. Um, so, I mean, and I don't have a, a wide network, I would say. I think it's been difficult just with my research and my department and a number of other factors, but the people on my committee who I consider mentors were people who uh, weren't necessarily in academia, which was a huge win for me. Um, you know, my advisor was great and he was suggesting people to be on my committee my first year uh, that were, you know, in our department or in a, in a neighboring department because they were easy boxes to check. You know, they, they fit the requirements to be on the committee. They could help with some expertise on, you know, statistics or plant, you know, genetics or something along those lines for me. But, um, and they're, they're fine. <laughs> I've, I've, as a, uh, Alex talked about I've, I've taken and lost some along the way and I'm perfectly fine with that and the ones that stuck around are the ones I added were people who were uh, outside of the UW system they they had been academics at one point or they had an expertise in in what I was doing but uh, they were they weren't in that mindset um, their goal wasn't to get me through it was to be the best possible committee member they could be I think I think academics and people at UW are so often weighed down by, you know, you're on 15 different committees. Maybe that's a small number for you. Um, you have your own research, your own grad students. Whereas these people outside of academia, like, like Sunny mentioned, they have job connections for the future. They can write letters of recommendation. They uh, are able to see your work from a, a, a more public lens rather than, you know, a really research heavy lens. And that's been wonderful. So the other part of that, I think, is that people don't know, often know that they can have a lot of committee members outside of their um, their department, especially at UW. In our department, at least in Ceph's, it, it wasn't clear how many, we, we didn't have a lot of um, good communication about that when I started, and now things have gotten much better. There's been a lot of improvements to our uh, administrative uh, uh, guidelines and advising, but in the beginning, it wasn't clear to me that I was even allowed to have people outside of the system, and now I see people with you know, people in the USDA, people in the Forest Service, um, scientists in industry uh, on their committees. And that's perfectly acceptable. And those people can give you a really nice outside perspective. So th I think that's one way, you know, you're not, you're not held down by um, just the people in your department, just the professors you have to take classes from. You can ask anyone. And even as Megan was saying before, you could just blind email someone from across the country and say, you know, hey, I really love your work. My project really aligns with yours. I think your expertise would be really amazing. Do you have any time to be on my committee from afar? Because we're all virtual now. It's not a whole lot different to get someone on your, uh, on your, your Zoom screen rather than in a room. Um, and even if we go back to in-person, tons of people will have someone you know, videoing in from another country, another state. Uh, so it's, it's just no big deal. If you see someone in the world that interests you, just reach out. Worst they can say is no, and then you reach out to someone else. Lana, I, I absolutely love what you're saying. And, and when I, when I'm, what I'm taking away, and I think it's a very important point for everyone to remember, is that um, your exact, your immediate mentor doesn't have perfect knowledge, right? And and so it's really helpful to build out and actually start making these connections, right, with people outside, including outside the university, as both you and, and Sunny have said. Um, do, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to move on because we're getting all these lovely questions now. So I'm going to move on to the next question, right? Here it is. Thoughts about what to do if you and your faculty member just have a different value set, right? And I'd actually like to hear this from both sides. For instance, I really value teaching and undergraduate mentoring, and I think my advisor thinks it's more or less a waste of time. I don't see that changing significantly in the next two years. So, so do I just let it go? <laughs> um, Megan, can I ask you? I know this is a really challenging question, but would you would you like to have a, a shout about these your thoughts about this? Sure, yeah. I feel like 
that's tough and I haven't been in this type of situation specifically where we've had different values about sort of how I should be spending my time, but I think it's really common that grad students have conflict with their faculty advisor. I think that more or less everyone has that at some point in their career where you want to be doing one thing and your faculty advisor wants you to be doing something else or you have different personalities. And so I guess I just say that to sort of normalize it. Like I, I think everyone I know sort of you start off everything's great and then something happens and it's horrible and most people can sort of resolve it. Um, and so I think for me as a, a young grad student, it was really hard for me to sort of like advocate for myself and speak for myself. And I think that having other faculty members that I went to, like, hey, my advisor and I are having sort of this disagreement about this thing. Can I talk to you about it? Can you give your input? Both helped me like um, sort of validate my perspective, but then get some perspective on like how to approach the situation. And I feel as though as I've gotten older and sort of, you know, a, older as a grad student and um, found my voice, I think that I've been able to advocate for myself more, just saying this is really important to me. This is what I want to be doing. It seems like this is maybe something that you don't value. Can we just have a conversation about it? Um, and I think maybe that works for some people and not others, but I think that if it's something that's important to you, and especially if it's in a career direction you want to go, or it's personally fulfilling to you to be doing that and sort of sustaining you through grad school, I think it's important to advocate for yourself and, and find a way to do those things. So, so Megan, I love what you're saying is that essentially you, you, I love the way that you said normalize, I'm going to normalize this. And then you talk about the importance of self-advocacy. Um, Alex, I'm actually going to ask you for your perspective, because this is one of the challenges that a mentor actually has, is actually this, this challenge about what, what a mentor wants, thinks is important versus a grad student. Yeah. So your thoughts on this, please. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. So, so this is a, this is a, a real and common situation. And I think part of the of the maturity of the question, right, is recognizing, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to change my advisor's mind, right? And so, so this is not, you know, so it makes it especially challenging. Um, um, I think that at some level, scope of activities for graduate students and uh, of the work that a graduate student and a mentor are doing together is always in some ways a negotiation. Right. And it's and it's a it's one where there is a power balance and it's hard to sort of advocate for your for yourself. But I think maybe um, if you uh, uh, some of the ways that you can advocate for yourself or put it in language that might resonate more uh, with with the advisor, I'm totally acknowledging the advisor should be coming to try to understand your language, too. But um, given sort of the situation, some of the things that that Megan mentioned, right, were, is this the sort of stuff that sustains me? Is this what the sort of thing that I need professionally? And I think those things are actually really, I think those are strong cases, right, that that your involvement in education is something that might be important for you educationally. And I think in particular, the sustain thing is important because graduate school, postdocs, the track that we're on, um, is sort of a degree in delayed gratification, right? The sort of things that we typically work on, really their, their realization horizon is very extended. You know, the, and um, I think it's important to, to have things in your life that you're getting a reward for on a, on a little bit more uh, immediate time scale. For me as faculty, teaching is a really big part of that. Interacting with, with mentees is a really big part of that. And I think you can make that argument for um, your activities within the scope of your, your, your activities at the university, undergraduate mentoring, education. And you, I think you can make an argument for that in sort of your outside life too, right? Your volunteer work or whatever those things are that give you those, that, that response that sort of helps you feel like you're having a meaningful contribution at both short and, and long time scales. Actually, that's fantastic. I, um, when you, Alex, when you talk about immediate gratification versus long time scales, I think this is very important, and it's important for mentors to remember this too. Yeah, um, Lila, did you did you have anything you'd like to say on this point? Yeah, uh, I think I think a lot of it was touched on. I think the one thing we haven't really talked about is the difference between an advisor and a and a mentor, faculty or or otherwise. And I think that to me speaks to an advisor, um, and and advisors to me 
my advisor is also a mentor, but there are two different sides in, in one. He has two different hats, right? One hat is the advisor, one hat is the mentor. And we've moved further and further into the mentor as kind of as Alex described, as we've gotten, you know, further and further into my degree and I've become more of a more understanding of what's what my responsibilities are and what I need to get done each each year. And the the that feels to me like an advisor role, kind of a um, kind of a boss role, if you will. I mean, in the very beginning, he was my boss. He was telling me what I need to be getting done each each week or each month or each year. And we were keeping on track. We were having um, check in meetings. And then as I kept going, I, I became the expert and I don't need that anymore. I can move away and be more um, more solo in, in my research and in my success. And then he became more of a, a, a mentor. But I, I think there were a lot of things I did in the beginning of my degree that he may not have agreed with, um, but I was able to get my work done. And that's all that mattered to him. He saw those those boxes being checked as I went. He, he didn't see me falling behind. I think it's one thing if you're falling behind, but if something matters to you and it fits into your, your program and you can even build your research around it, you know, teaching something people build research around. I don't see it being a downside. I, I don't mean to insinuate you should manipulate your uh, advisor, but you know, we all have hobbies outside of our work. Um, they're necessary to sustain us. So I, I don't see it as a downside if you can still succeed in your in your degree. Um, I think that's just a, a classic boss uh, uh, employee uh, disagreement that will probably come up that just needs to be either talked through or figured out. Um, but it's it's definitely a tricky situation. So, so Lana, what I liked about what you've just said is that you basically you brought into the very important um, point that there's a distinction between advisor and mentor and sometimes they overlap, but that that relationship actually changes over time, which is exactly what, what we want from, from um, grad school, right? Is that we do want to see that equalization of the relationships because you're becoming colleagues. So fantastic, thank you. Okay, let me ask our panel the next question, right? Is cold emailing the best way to reach out to potential committee members outside of academia, or should students ask a professor to virtually introduce them? Um, Sunny, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that one. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think cold calling is perfectly, um, you know, legitimate and something that you can do. But I personally really do like to introduce my students virtually through email to my colleagues or people I know there out in the professional world. And that's because I'll probably say things about my students that they wouldn't necessarily feel like comfortable, uh, you know, saying about themselves, uh, brag about them a little bit, really get this person excited about them. So um, I really like doing that. If you are interested in making connections within the network of your advisor or mentor, I think a good place to start is just asking them to make that that uh, connection for you. That's fantastic. Um, Lila, coming back to you, cold calling, is this something you've done? Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually just cold called um, a new professor in biology because I want him to be my GSR. And I'd actually met him before that. I didn't think he remembered me. Um, it was in person. It was like a year and a half ago. It was before COVID. So it was really like 10 years ago. Uh, and he he was great. He responded and said, I 100% remember you. But he didn't say, yes, of course, I'll be your GSR. He said, let's talk. And so we had a Zoom meeting. He just talked to me about my research. And I think what he was trying to do is like figure out whether he was a good fit. Um, for my sake and for his sake. And I think if you cold email someone, you're always gonna have them interested in hearing about you and talking to you. And so I think that, I think it'll really go like, you'll send an email, hopefully they'll respond. If they don't send another email, if they respond, set up a meeting and just talk. Don't, don't ask them anything, just let them guide the conversation and maybe ask more questions about their work, you know, get to know them as well. And I think from there, you've already built like the base of a relationship, which Sunny would have already built for you, I think as a good, uh, advisor or mentor, you know, setting the stage for that kind of, it, it does the work for you. I think that's wonderful. And I, I would hope that my mentors would also reach out. They've done that before I can think of examples. So yeah, all of that is, is it's perfectly doable. Um, it just might take some work. Yeah. So, so let me twist this a little bit. The, so essentially, um, we've basically heard that cold, we've heard from Sunny that she likes to, um, she likes to introduce her students. We've heard success from Lila about cold calling. I'm actually going to ask Megan and then Alex, um, you know, given that people have different personalities and they've got different levels of confidence and everything like that, 
can you tell us is what's, what's your relative experience with cold calling versus asking an advisor to introduce you? Like, what do you think is has been a more successful tactic in your life? Yeah. So Megan, I'm going to ask you first, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think I, I can just really only speak from my experience where um, my research advisor is quite young. We both started at the UW at the same time. And so I think that sort of the network of people that he knows is maybe not as large as someone who's, you know, a full professor who's been around for quite a while. And so I think that has a large influence on how many people he's able to sort of network for me for, I guess. Um, but when he has done that, it's been um, so great, basically for all the reasons Sunny said that um, I think that, yeah, he can sort of advocate for me in a way that I necessarily wouldn't myself. Um, and so those have been really successful. I've really only cold called people recently in the pandemic when it's been more comfortable to sort of reach out to people virtually. Um, but in my experience, the advice I've been given, especially when reaching out to people sort of in industry or in tech is that um, if you want someone to mentor you, usually I, the advice I've been given is you should ask for something specific. You should ask for what you want. Hey, I see that you've done this thing. Can you help me? Because you're in this career position and I'm thinking about applying for this job. Can you help me with my resume or something really specific? That's not just like, can you help me? Um, can help the person you're contacting decide if they're able to do that and if they have the time to do that. Um, and so I think being specific about uh, knowing what is it that I need to be successful and who is it that I can reach out to um, with that question. So I think just really doing sort of the personal internal reflection of what, what am I looking for and what do I need um, is helpful. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. So be specific. Know what you're after. I, I think that's fabulous. Yeah, Alex, cold calling. What happens when you get cold calls? Right. I I both get cold called and I also still have to do cold calls. <laughs> research collaborations. And what Megan said about being really specific is excellent. You know, some of these things uh, I realize are sort of nuggets of truth that, that I didn't, I hadn't even, art, hadn't articulated either. Um, so, um, but, I, but sometimes it can be like, you know, that's the end state or whatever, but sometimes it can be hard to get to that point of like, what is the specific thing? Like sometimes like if I'm starting a research collaboration or I'm cold calling someone or whatever, I think I know sort of what that, that initial transaction looks like with the idea that it would grow. Um, and so maybe there's times that are like that, but other times maybe for more of the mentorship, like, role, you have a little bit of a harder time articulating that at first. And that's where maybe you can lean on your existing set of mentors to help you sort of define what, you know, there's this piece that I'm missing that I feel like I need, you know, what sort of person would play that role? What is it that this, this piece is? Or fellow graduate students, you know, like, how does this work for you? Um, so that, I think that getting to that specificity can be a process. Um, uh, the other thing that uh, I'll, I'll add to this is that there are also things that we should all probably be educating ourselves, absolutely be educating our, ourselves about that are sort of intermediary between this, the, the introductions, right? I, I think one of my main roles, one of my big roles as a mentor is introduce is plugging um, my mentees into my network. Um, and so that's where these introductions come in. Um, and so absolutely, I think that's been successful, but then also we all need to sort of help educate ourselves about these sort of frameworks or opportunities that are out there to help help build networks. Like, so I'm, I'm, uh, I think there's a particularly good success story for a student in my group who was part of the, the research exchange, which is a consortium between a bunch of major research universities. Um, uh, UW is one of them that takes rising graduate students and um, uh, sends them to other universities, sort of pays for research visits. And so they kind of do like, like a faculty talk and embed in a research group and meet with faculty and students there. And so it's a way, even before you've identified a postdoc mentor to sort of have practice doing that, maybe make those connections. Um, uh, and this particular one uh, really focuses on, on uh, minority students, um, but it's something that I know the provost is really behind and there's other, uh, there's other things like that. Um, and so we should all be trying to educate ourselves to sort of what are these opportunities in, in that field that we can sort of connect people people up with. Um, and uh, uh, along those lines, I'll sort of say that 
uh, necessarily your your advisor is, is probably going to be their network is probably going to be most focused on academics or research adjacent sort of connections, you know, like the federal agencies or state agencies that they work with. And that is that is a limitation of that is just part of the landscape. That's one that I think many of us as faculty, as mentors, um, care a lot about expanding and making sure that we make connections for people. But that is something that that we have and and, and we do have, you know, connections to other places too, but that's that is a limitation. So that just means that um, when you're when you're trying to take advantage of that network, you're gonna have to work harder the more that you that you reach a field. Yeah. Um, and hopefully uh, mentor can help you with that too. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that you as a panel brought up the the absolutely central part and, and importance of networking and recognizing that networking is actually um, a, a, a major issue in terms of um, stepping outside the network that your advisor has but also going to these broader networks that you have. It is a major equity and issue, uh, equity and inclusion issue. We know that um, networking is absolutely central to the development of um, healthy careers. And um, it is our roles to basically um, support networking and to support the networking of grad students. Um, so um, very important, yeah. Um, we've, got, we've got a question that's come through, which I, which I think is also incredibly important. Um, and this is, how can first year students set boundaries properly when it comes to work-life balance and responsibilities? Really hard question for faculty to answer. <laughs> So, um, Megan, do you, would you like to take a shot at this? I think this is an incredibly difficult question to, to answer. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I did this well at all my first year. I'm not sure if other people have more helpful comments. I think that it took me time and comfortability sort of with the power dynamics to be able to set boundaries. So maybe someone else has more helpful advice, but I didn't do it well, and I think that's just because it of the power dynamics. Yeah, and, yeah. I think it's very important to recognize this, Megan, is is being able to, yeah, is is especially in your in your beginning in your first year. Um, Lila, did you face this as well? Did you have any recommendations about to do how to do this? Uh, I think that I got very lucky with my advisor. Basically, uh, he does not work after a certain point in the night. He does not expect me to be working after a certain point in the night. His expectations for me have always been lower than they were for myself. That was just luck. I think other advisors and other students I've met, it's the inverse of that. And it's really, really difficult. Um, I think one thing I ran into was I set poor boundaries for myself, uh, which Megan, I'm sure you ran into this too, uh, where I expected that I, the goals I set for myself were way too way too much. Um, I, I just met a goal on time this year, the fifth year of my PhD. For the first time ever, I met a goal that I had put on a calendar successfully. Uh, and it, was, it wasn't because I was bad at anything. It was just because I was setting those goals way too short of timelines. And I, I just wasn't being realistic with myself. Um, so I think in general, I think it's important to do this for yourself first and then to move on to your, to your boss, your mentor, your, your committee, right? I think one thing to keep in mind is that talking to other students is probably the best bet if you're a student struggling with this because I didn't realize the the diversity of expectations that were out there even within my own department and I saw people having you know hours long um, um, lab meetings and our lab meetings were like 20 minutes at that point and I saw people you know working all night long and I, I never felt that pressure from my advisor. So, so talking to other people and then, you know, if you see someone who's really, really supportive of their students' work-life work balance, but they have nothing to do with your research, that's someone you can put on your committee. Like you can find a reason to put that person on your committee. And then all of a sudden you have someone who's at almost the same level as your advisor in your, in your, um, your research sphere who can advocate for you uh, if you need it. But that's a really tough one. I, I think... Yeah, there's, there's no good answer to it. I'm not sure that um, there's a perfect answer, but it did really help me to talk to other people and to see what other people were putting on themselves. And sometimes it's easier to understand something as overwhelming when you see someone else being overwhelmed by it, and then you can equate it back to your own life. 
Um, fantastic advice, right? Lila is thinking about who's modeling the type of life that you want and then and then getting getting them involved in your in your network, right? Sunny, are we good at setting work-life boundaries for ourselves and our students? <laughs> Um, similar to, I guess, Megan and Lila, I feel that, uh, you know, when I was in that stage of my career, I also didn't set these boundaries. And I actually didn't think I, you know, I wasn't really aware of the, that this was something we should be setting boundaries about or thinking about, you know, it was the norm um, in the, the econ department that I was in where you would see faculty in their offices after hours with the lights on and email exchanges about research would carry on until uh, you know early hours of the morning and that was just really the norm and that's what I saw but I think you know it's things have changed I'm a bit older and hopefully you know I think well I think things are starting to change and I think maybe just the first step is to sort of bring that topic up for discussion with your advisor and just say, you know, I'd like to set aside some time to talk about work-life balance. What's your approach? What do you think are the norms in the field? Are these things changing? What's the, the variety of um, sort of approaches to this within the field? And just bring that up as a topic to get your advisor to start thinking about that or your mentor to start thinking about that. And I think Lila had some good advice about sort of looking at the variety out there and trying to, you know, have a good representation of that within your committee or in your professional sphere. Uh, but yeah, I'm by no means an expert in this area <laughs> of work-life balance. Alex, have you, have you found the magic answer and the magic bullet to this? Uh, yeah, I'm so far from the magic bullet from myself that it's, um, it's you know, and that's part of the problem is like people have said of modeling this, um, uh, we do a poor job modeling this and it, and it is a responsibility for ourselves and for our students to do better. So um, uh, a, th a theme that I think a bunch of people have sort of brought up here is that if you are upfront with your advisor, whether it's your professional goals or your needs with work-life balance or other things that that at least makes them aware from that. I wouldn't say that that guarantees that you've got a clean, easy path to, to sort of, you know, making it all work out. But, um, but I think that uh, that that is important. If, if it's something that's important for you, um, yeah, you should you should talk about it. And I think I think I would like to hope that if advisors see that you are passionate, committed, um, dedicated to learning and discovery into the project, that that actually is what they're looking for. And they're using these other indicators as proxies for that. And if once they realize that those are poor proxies, or if they if they have the maturity to realize those are poor pro that the time of day is a poor proxy for your dedication to the project, then um, that those other sort of fundamental truths will win. You know, um, folks, um, I hate to say it, but we've actually run out of time. It's like, I feel that we've only just started. Um, and we've had so many fantastic questions as well. Um, so um, what, I, what I just wanted to do is just do a, a very quick summary. Um, and I understand Anthony's got a few more poll questions to ask everybody before we adjourn. But um, essentially what you've heard from our wonderful panelists, thank you so much. What wonderful advice that you've been giving. We've basically been thinking about different aspects of mentoring. We've been looking at um, the importance of mentoring as a networking tool, right? So we've learned about how important it is to step outside your immediate um, advisor and actually build this much broader network, um, including doing things like cold calling. We've learned how to build that um, mentor-mentee relationship like how to establish it, how to think through goals as you start, um, and how to actually define your parameter space, right, so that you can actually find some sort of balance in your lives. And then um, the last thing that we've, we've been doing is that we've been basically talking about how to make the most of our mentoring and grad student success, right? So um, it's very important to recognize both from, from, from the mentor side that um, when students um, feel better mentored, they're more likely to succeed. So it's in our interest as mentors to basically support our students as much as possible. Um, Mentor-mentee relationships might always not always be perfect, right? And again, this actually speaks to the importance of actually building this broader network of support. And then um, building into that network, people who are modeling behaviors or approaches 
that can help you develop your skill set um, and and develop your your network in a better way. So um, everyone, thank you very very much. Um, I especially want to thank our attendees. I'm so sorry we we um, can't see you within this environment, but the questions that you've given us have been absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much for that. Um, um, Anthony, I'd like to um, hand us over to you to oh. to ask um, additional poll questions. Great. So thank you for your indulgence, everyone. So just I'm launching the next uh, poll. So this one uh, is about building your networks and relationships. We just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Okay, a few more seconds. Great, thank you. All right, so we got one more. And the last one is just about feedback. So this, is, this allows us to um, get a little more perspective about how we can you know, keep helping you. Yeah, it's a pity it's only been an hour, really. <laughs> <laughs> right, absolutely. You know, obviously, in, in normal times, this would be an hour and a half, you'd have lunch, you know, we'd have a nicely catered lunch for you. And, you know, there'd be plenty of time to network as well. Uh, and I'm sure our panelists are, are open to having you contact them as well for any questions or observations. And thank you, speaking of our panelists, thank you, Megan, thank you, Lila, thank you, Sunny, thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm very, very appreciative. And, and Carrie, thank you very much for your participation. It just means the world to, to us in the Office of Academic Affairs. We just really appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with you.